Our scripture this morning comes out of, the, out of the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 29, verses 16 through 30. It's there found in your bulletin. If you would like to follow along, Austin is here to read our scripture for us. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Jacob loved Rachel. And he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place, and made a feast. But in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave his female servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her servant. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, it is not so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his female servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her servant. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah and served Laban for another seven years. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you bow with me, please? Almighty God, pour out your spirit upon this, your word, and make it be for us the word of life that we might be people of life. And now, O oh God, hide me behind your cross that your message of love and grace might shine through for the redemption of the world. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I knew a girl once who had the misfortune of being born beautiful. Even in childhood, even in childhood, she saw the power that she could wield with her physical attractiveness. As she entered her teenage years, she was an absolute knockout. Her long flowing hair, her tight wranglers that she used to wear, even her low-cut blouses that she used to wear as she uh, became a teenager. At first, she used her beauty to manipulate others, but eventually, eventually others came to use her beauty to manipulate her. She dated one boy and then the next, eventually even transferring school so she could find more boys to date. She came to feel she was powerless or invisible unless some man was in love with her, and over the years there were many men who were in love with her. Love for her had become an idol. We can know something has become an idol when its demands on us exceed proper boundaries. Making an idol out of love may, be, may mean allowing a, a lover to exploit or abuse you. Or it may cause other pathologies in a relationship, relationships that create more tension than freedom, that cause more fights than anything else, that promote and create inequality, or that create an environment of turmoil and unhealthiness. Or they're not just dysfunctional relationships. I believe that they are idolatrous relationships. An idolatrous attachment to another person may lead you to break any promise, to rationalize any indiscretion, or betray any other allegiance in order to hold on to it. It may drive you to violate any good and proper boundary. And these types of relationships are, are, are everywhere from one-night stands and, and hookups to, to long-term marriages, from divorces and, and breakups, from multiple marriages to multiple sexual partners. It seems as though our culture is making a, a false god out of romantic love more and more and more and more. 
Even the rise of the pornography industry highlights our idolatrous relationship with, I, with romantic love. And it's not just our culture. It's not just the culture out there. It's even the, the culture inside the church. I find it when a when, I, when, it, when thousands of dollars are spent on weddings, but only a few dollars are spent on premarital counseling. I find it when a husband rules the household, making every major decision by himself without the input of his wife, all in the name of God, I might add. I find it when the preacher is the very last one in the church to recognize and to know about a marriage that's fallen apart in the life of the church. Romantic love being an idol is not something any of us are immune to. Today we are continuing our series dealing with these things, these things that, that, that offer us lots of promises, but they are empty promises. These are things that will rob us of our lives. Technically, they're called idols. Many of us would not call them idols at all. They would just, we would just call them things that are in our lives. In fact, good things that are in our lives. We saw last week that those things that have, that have the greatest potential for good oftentimes have the greatest potential to harm us as well. As we, as we hold on to those so closely, as we make them first in our lives, they become idolatrous and they rob us of our, of our lives. There's a story in the Bible that illustrates how the quest for love can become idolatrous, even a form of slavery. It is said, it is said that, that men use love to get sex and women use sex to get love. This, this story that we're examining today shows how both of those things are idolatrous. It's the story of, of Jacob and Leah that we find in chapter 29 of Genesis. Just, just as last week, uh, six months ago, we examined this story that we're going to be examining today. We're going to be examining it from a, from a bit of a different perspective. Last week, we learned, how, we learned about Abraham and, and God's promise to Abraham, how God called Abraham from the people of all of the earth and said, Abraham, uh, I, I'm, I'm, going to make a, I'm going to make a covenant with you. You are going to be the father of a great nation. And I will give you a land, and I will bless you to be a blessing to others. And Abraham said, I'm, I'm an old man. I'm 75 years old. My wife is 65 years old, well past the age of childbearing. How in the world can this be? And God took him outside of his tent, and he said, look up at the stars. You see the number of stars? That will be the number of the descendants that you have, and you will be the father of a great nation. 25 years later, they finally, finally, uh, they, had, they experienced the birth of their son Isaac. And last week we saw how, how Abraham's love for his son Isaac had become idolatrous because Isaac was everything to him. Everything. Isaac was everything that Abraham had ever wanted. All of his hopes, all of his dreams, they all rested on Isaac. And God called Abraham to give up Isaac. And we saw last week that oftentimes we will not understand and we will not recognize how the love that we have for our families have become idolatrous until we, start, until, we are, until we are required to start making choices between our own faith and our family. And so Isaac grew and he got married uh, and he and his wife had twin sons twin sons, Esau and, uh, Esau and, uh, and, and Jacob, his younger brother. The, although the two sons were born just moments apart, in that culture, the oldest son was the family. We've already, we've already examined this before. The oldest son was the family. The oldest son inherited at least one half of the inheritance, no matter how many children there were. The oldest son at, got at least half of the inheritance automatically, and then the rest of the inheritance was divided up between the oldest son and all the rest of the children. And so the oldest son would always get more than 50%. And the oldest son also really was the Lord over all of the family. They were the head of the family. And so no doubt, no doubt it's, it shouldn't come as a surprise to us that Esau, the oldest son, was his father's favorite. Jacob, uh, or excuse me, yeah, uh, uh, 
Isaac loved, loved Esau. Isaac loved Esau more than anything else. E- Esau was an outdoorsman. He was an outdoorsman. He was a, he was a man's man kind of thing. And, and so I am sure that, that Esau and his father spent lots of days out in the wilderness hunting together and, and building a, a, a strong bond. Jacob, however, loved domestic duties around the home. He loved to cook and he loved to, to help out around the house. And so he was the favorite of, of his mother. We've, we've already heard how that relationship between these two boys, it began to be strained when, uh, when, when Jacob really stole his brother's birthright or his, his, brother's, his brother's inheritance. And then and near the end of their father's, and near the end of their father's life, he then even stole his, brother, or his, his father's blessing. It was supposed to go to the older brother, but Jacob, the younger brother, stole his father's blessing. And so finally, finally the, finally the relationship got to, got to such a degree that Esau told his brother, he said, if I ever see you again, I'm going to kill you. And so, so Jacob find well, he has to escape. And he escapes where would you guess? Yes, back to his mother's hometown, his beloved mother's hometown. He goes back to his mother's family, and, and he finds, uh, Jacob finds his uncle Laban, who was his mother's, his mother's brother. He finds him, and Laban is a very successful man. He had lots of herds and lots of flocks, and, and he hired, uh, Laban hired Jacob as a shepherd for him. And Laban um, was, well, he was, he was rich and he was, uh, he was very, very, very successful before Jacob came to work for him. But, in, but now his success became even greater. His, his flocks and his herds, they began, to, they began to expand even more because it seemed as though everything that Jacob did, God was blessing it. And so after a couple of years of working for him, Laban came to Jacob and said, you have been working for me and you've been so diligent. God has blessed me in incredible ways. How could I ever repay you? How could I ever repay you for, for all of these years of, of working for me? And Jacob's answer was one word, Rachel. Rachel. Now, the Bible describes Rachel as one who is lovely in form. That's code for she was a knockout. <laughs> she, was, she was beautiful. All the men would have, would, have, would, have wanted, would have wanted Rachel. And so Laban, seeing that he had an opportunity, told Jacob that he must work seven years for the hand of his daughter Rachel. That was four times, four times the normal amount that would have been paid for a bride. A bride. The Bible says that those seven years seem like only a, a few days to Jacob because of his love for Rachel. He could hardly wait to marry her, so he went to Laban and said, give me my wife. My time is completed, and I want to lie, I want to lie with her. Now the, now, the Hebrew phrase is unusually frank, explicit, and sexual for ordinary ancient discourse. Imagine, imagine saying to a father today, I can't wait to take your daughter to bed and give her to me so I can marry her. It shows us a man who is overwhelmed with emotional and sexual longings for, for one woman. Why? Why was Jacob so empty? Well, Well, his life had been empty. He had never had his father's love. He had lost his beloved mother's love, and he had no concept at all of God's love for him. He must have thought to himself, if I had her, if I had Rachel, finally, finally something in my miserable life would be right. If I had her, it would fix everything. If I had her, then I would have meaning and purpose in my life. At the end of the long-awaited wedding day, Jacob, being heavy with wine, went into the wedding chamber to lay with his newly heavy-veiled wife. Now, Rachel as we've already heard, had a sister named Leah. Whereas, again, the Bible describes Rachel as lovely in form and beautiful, it describes Leah as having weak eyes. 
Now, some have interpreted this to mean that she needed to wear glasses. That's not what it means. It means that she was homely. She was, you know, that some are easy on the eyes. <laughs> Leah was just the opposite. So the morning after the wedding, as Jacob aroused from his drunken due sleep, he looked across the bed and he saw the weak-eyed Leah in his bed instead of the great-figured, beautiful Rachel Jacob had been tricked. Now, with all due respect to Leah, a truth about life can be found, I believe, right here. No matter what created thing we put our hope in, in the morning, it is always Leah, never Rachel. Those created things that we, find to, that we, that we try to find our life's meaning in, those things on which we put our hopes and our dreams, those things we look to for fulfillment will always disappoint us because putting the weight of our deepest hopes and longings on a person or any other created thing will crush them with our expectations. That's so important, I'm going to say it again. When we put our hopes and dreams on those, on those things, on those created things, we will always, they, they, will, they, will, they will always disappoint us. They will always disappoint us because they will disappoint us under the crushing weight of those expectations. Putting those types of expectations on a person will distort our marriages. It will distort our friendships in hundreds of ways. No person, not even the best person, can ever give your soul all it needs. No person can ever give your soul all that it needs. We will always wake up with Leah instead of Rachel. No matter what it is, when we put our hope and our trust on things of this world, they will always disappoint us. I mean, it could be, it could be, it, I mean, we know that this happens, by the way. Think about it. Think about it. You get a brand new automobile. It has all of the bells and whistles. It even has a heated steering wheel. I mean, it is top of the, it is the top of the top of the top. Have you ever noticed that within just a couple of weeks, you start finding things that are wrong with it? You know, I would have thought that there would have been a reading light right there. You know, there's no light in the, in the glove box when I open it. What kind of trash vehicle is this? You see, when we put our hopes and our, and our dreams into things to try to make us happy, they will always be crushed by our expectations, always. Things and people. And so we think that we're going to find Rachel, but we're always going to find Leah when we put our hope and trust in things. But the story continues. The story continues. Jacob still wanted Rachel, and he got her too. After a week of, of marriage to Leah, he was given Rachel in exchange for another seven years of work for Laban. Now, now often in reading this story, we, we hurry through the next section until we get to the 12 sons of, of Jacob. And by the way, those 12 sons are important for those, those 12 sons are where we get the 12 tribes of Israel. And so the, these names are important, no doubt. But I want us to pause and examine this part of the story. Imagine, imagine if you will, how Leah felt. Imagine, if you will, how Leah must have felt. We find Leah doing to Jacob what Jacob had been doing to Rachel all along. Leah was unwanted. Even her father knew that he would be unable to marry her off, and so he had to trick a man into marrying her. And so she set her heart's hope on getting her husband's love. Verses 31 through 35 of, of chapter 29 may be the most heart wrenching chapter or heart wrenching verses in all of the Bible. She was unloved and she knew it. Every day, every day, she saw the man that she loved in the arms of another woman, her sister. Every day, every day was like another knife in her heart. If I have babies, she thought, then. 
then my husband will finally come to love me. Then my, finally my unhappy life will have meaning. But with each, but with each baby, she was pushed further into the hell of loneliness. Let's, let's look at this progression and note her brokenness revealed in the names of her children. With each passing birth, she is yearning to receive the love of her husband. Listen to these verses. When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, for she said, It is because the Lord has seen my misery, surely my husband will love me now. She conceived again. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, Because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. So, we named, so she named him Simeon. Again, she conceived, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, Now, at last, my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. And so she named him Levi. She conceived again. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, This time I will praise the Lord. This time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah. Then she stopped having children. Heart-wrenching, yet beautiful at the same time. Notice that she named her last child Judah, of whom Jesus is a descendant. She named him, this time I will praise the Lord. You see, always she had been putting her hopes and dreams and trust in the love of her husband, and she could never find it. She could never get that love. And I think it's a key to understanding how to ever overcome this false god of, of romantic love. It is only when we recognize that God loves us. God is the one who ultimately loves us. We will come to recognize that He is the real bridegroom. This is the God who loves the unwanted, the weak, and the unloved people like you and me. There are people in the world and people here today and, and people listening today who have not found a romantic partner or who have found themselves who have found themselves single again, and they need to hear the Lord say, I am the true bridegroom. Mine are the only set of arms that will keep you, that will, that will give you all your heart's desire, and my arms await you at the end of time. Know that I love you. But even those of us who are married near, need to hear the, we need to hear the same thing. We need to hear those words in order to save our marriages from the crushing weight of our, design, of, of our divine expectations of our marriages. If you marry someone expecting them to be like a God, it is only inevitable that they will disappoint you. It's not that you should love your spouse less but rather you should love God more. It's not that you should love your spouse less, but rather you should love God more. When we come to realize that Jesus came into the world and took upon himself our sins and died in our place, then we will begin to realize God's love for us. If we, are, if we are deeply moved by the sight of His love for us, then it detaches, it detaches our hearts and allows Him to be our Savior, no other person. But we can only do that when we recognize that Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is our Savior. Christ alone is our Redeemer, not our spouses, not our friends, not our mates, only Christ alone. The last time I saw that girl from my childhood, she looked ragged and tired. She had four children. All four of the children had different fathers, and she had only married one of those fathers. 
Not long ago, she died of a drug overdose. She had never found her heart's true desire in a man. God, through Jesus Christ, is the only one that can, feel, that can fill that deepest need in our lives. The only one. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, it is only in Jesus Christ that we will find our deepest needs, our deepest hopes, our deepest desires filled. Only in Christ. Would you bow with me? Well, God, some of us tragically spend all of our lives looking for hope and meaning and purpose. We look for hope and meaning and purpose in relationships, in our children even in our marriages. We think if we can ever have the love of a a spouse, then it would fix everything in us. God, sometimes our marriages crumble under the crushing weight of those divine expectations. Help us to realize on this day there is only one only one who can meet those expectations. There is only one who can redeem. There is only one who can save, and that is Jesus our Lord. Oh God, help us to put our hope, our faith, our trust in you and you alone. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.